months off, and here we are in the new year. And uh, we're going to be looking at the last lesson of uh, the new birth, part five. We thank God for what he's teaching us in this. It's reminding us that as we go into this new year, how important it is to know that Christ has all been paid through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that this life that we have that is eternal in him. That's what we're looking at. That is our hope and strength as believers in Christ Jesus. It is the fact that one day we shall be with him. That our life is that the promise of God is eternal life. It's not about the greatest life that you have here. But we're learning through the word of God that it says that if all of that we are living for is this world in which we live in now, that we should be pitied. Because God has so much more in store for us, eternal life with him. And so I thank God tonight that he has a plan for each and every one of us, that we might know him and the power of his resurrection. That we would understand that because we have new life, that we can also live in his life while we're walking in this life here, on this journey that we're on. That we can begin to say that every step I take is a step closer to being with him, but it's also walking in him that allows us to know that our eternity is truly true when you begin to see the power of God working in your life. When you begin to know that the change has come because of Jesus, not because of anything that we have done that we could boast, but it's because of his great love for us that new life has come into us. So when we're sharing this hope with others, that we're sharing a hope with them that will remain because that's the promise of God that we have through Christ our Lord. And so as we're looking at this lesson tonight, we're going to be just tying the ends together. We're going to be talking about the Word of God and the fact that it says that, um, that first there's an inward proof of Christ, there's an outgoing proof of Christ, and there's an outward proof of Christ in us. So that we can know then that there's an inward proof God that has touched us, we're alive in Him, and that He has sent us to let the light shine, and then we can see the evidence of His life, not only as we walk, but the command that He has said to us to go into the world and preach the gospel, that we make disciples, and we begin to see lives change because of the work that God has called us to. And so as we go to prayer tonight, I, 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 the prayer request sheet is going around, and we, we know that there's many that are in need of prayer, need of great help, because many are lost, but sometimes we just live in, in a time of hopelessness. There's a time that comes, and, and people are just wondering, is, are things looking like they are because Christ is soon to come back? Well, I don't know when he's coming back, but the Word of God said, be ready, because he's coming as a thief in the night. And if you knew when the thief was coming, then you didn't have nothing to worry about. But it says because of that, then we need to be on guard. We need to be found doing the work that he has called us to. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord, and we want to be ready. Lord, uh, standing on guard, Lord, uh, standing at our post, Lord, doing what you have called us to do in you. Lord, I thank you tonight, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, for you, how you brought us through this past year and your faithfulness, Lord, watching over us and keeping us. And we know, Lord, in this year, Lord, this past year, Lord, that we've lost loved ones, Lord, and, and members of the body of Christ. And yet, Lord, we know, dear Heavenly Father, you have promised to them that those that sleep in you, Lord, shall be raised up, Lord, in that great day, Lord. And, and those that remain will also be caught up in the air. Lord, I pray tonight, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, that we would trust you, believe you, Lord, for your word that is life to us. So we ask that you would open up our understanding to the truth of Scripture. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to embrace, Lord, this new life that you have given us. For we have new birth in you. Lord, I pray tonight, dear Heavenly Father, that we will begin to understand the empowerment that you have given us, Lord. Because the old has, we have died to and we have been made alive in you. And so, Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that you would lead us, Holy Spirit, in this hour, in this time that we're meeting. We ask your blessing upon the children's ministry, Lord, and the youth ministry as they'll meet later, dear God, that you would just move, Lord, upon not only the teacher, Lord, but those that the hearing of your word, Lord, may they be encouraged. I thank you, Lord, for these saints tonight, Lord, that have come. But Lord, they want to even grow even more, Lord, in you and walk stronger in the word, Lord, that you have given to us. And, and so, Lord, we ask that you would just lead us now. Guide us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So now we're going to begin to look at the new birth. It's threefold proof. 
In 1 John 5, it says, whoever believes that Jesus Christ believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God and whoever loves him who begot also loves him who is begotten of him everyone who believes that Jesus Christ believes it that everyone that believes is Jesus Christ has been born of God and everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him we looked at both of these translations because all the beginning and the begotting sometimes gets me thrown off. I know that Dale, Dale understood every bit of it because we talked about that, that King James uh, flow that has. But what it's just saying is that who begot Christ? God the Father. And it says that who is the begotten of the Father is Jesus Christ our Lord. So everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father also loves the one born of him. And that's what we need to know tonight. You can't love the Father without loving the Son. You cannot have one without having the other. No one goes to the Father except through the Son. He says, I am I'm the only, I'm the only um, portal that you can come through to get to the Father. There is no other way to the Father except through Jesus Christ our Lord. There will be many that will try to sneak in from him in many ways. But there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ our Lord. So everyone born again, child of God, every born again child of God has the threefold proof of the new birth proof that, it, that he is a child of God. This threefold proof are the first inward proof, the second one is the outgoing proof, and the third is the outward proof. And what we're talking about tonight, we'll go through the scriptures and see what it's saying about that. The first one talks about the inward proof. That in 1 John 5, um, chapter, verse 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Your faith in Christ, that he is God, is personal evidence that you are a child of God. So we first have to believe that he truly is God. As John says to us, that, that he was before all things, that the flesh became, uh, that the spirit man became flesh and he dwelt among us. It says the word became life and Jesus is the word. And so scripture lets us know that God came to earth born of a virgin. We under, we've heard and, and, and preached and, and read and, and know what the scripture says. But here it's just telling us that there's an inward proof that we can know. People cannot understand the things of God unless Christ is in their life. Unless you're born again, these are words that, and people say, well I believe there's a God. But you can't go beyond that understanding that there has to be a creator. But to have a relationship with him, you have to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. There is no other way. You can read and study all of the things, but until you are born again, none of that will ever make sense. You can believe that there is a God. There's belief, there's belief that others, that people not only believe there is a God, they believe that they can be God. But the word tells us that there is only one, that scripture says, that you can search all over, and God says, I have, and there is no other God but him. So when we're looking at the text tonight, it just tells us that whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Your faith in Christ, that he is God, is personal evidence that you are a child of God. So it tells us then if I'm born again, then I also believe that not only is he the Christ, but he is truly God. That there is no separation. There's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so when we begin to understand that Jesus Christ is not only the Savior of the world, he is also the creator of the world. That he is He is God completely. God man and he is the, uh, the, uh, the God man and he is God's son. He is the creator of all things. And so when we're talking about Jesus, let's not just talk about him as the one who came born of the virgin. He is the one that said, let there be light. He is the one that caused all things to be. He said everything that's created came through him, that he might give the glory to the Father. So when we're looking at the text tonight, it's beginning to prove that there's an inward proof. The inward proof is that until I'm born again, I cannot understand God's love for us. We cannot understand that God sending his son. We cannot understand that we would matter so much that God would send his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And sometimes, sometimes we talk these scriptures. We say them so fast that they run right off our tongue. But here is telling us that we need to stop. 
We need to pay attention to what the Word of God has to say. Because when we begin to get a handle on the fact that Jesus Christ is God, and we are saved through Him, and I have new life in Him, then it tells me that I can begin to expect some greater things out of my life that I could never have gotten on my own. I can begin to live in a way that I could never live on my own. I can begin to do things that I could never do on my own. That the transformation of new life through Jesus Christ our Lord transforms us from this nature that we were born in sin to be able to live a life that what would bring glory glory and honor unto the Father. So when it talks to us that first, first of all, that we have to have an inward proof, that proof is that we can understand that my love, the Bible tells us what, love one another as I have loved you. For us to love in the way that God loves, it takes God's life to be inside of us. Because I can tell you right now, you can look at outside of the world and say, there's people out there I wouldn't love, but I can bring it closer to that. There's family members that it takes Christ to love. Uh, family members have done things and if Christ's love wasn't in you, you could not wrap your arms around them and say to them, I forgive you, I love you. It takes the empowerment of God. We would like to think that I can do this here, but it takes the power of God to love the way God loves. And God loves us. It takes a God to love us. It takes a God who cares about us in such a way that we might begin to understand just how deep and how powerful God's love for us truly is. So the inward proof into the new birth. In 1 John 5, we want to look at verse 9 and, and down to um, verse 15. It says, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar. So it tells us, first of all, that if Jesus is not the Christ, then it says that when God says, this is my beloved son, and we say that Jesus Christ is not the son of God, then we're saying God is a liar. It just says that God has said, I have done this. I have revealed this to you. I have shown this to you. And he who believes in the son of God has the witness in himself, which is the witness, the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you the comforter. He's going to dwell in you, and he's going to tell you of all things concerning Jesus concerning him, concerning why he came, why he lives, the things he desires of us and has made, a, made it possible for us to have a, a, an intimate relationship with the creator of the world, God Almighty. And it says to us that if we don't believe that, then we're saying that God is a liar because he does not believe the testimony that God has given of his son. And when he said when he was baptized that this is my beloved son, and he said to John the Baptist, in whom you see my spirit dwell upon and remain, that is he. And John said, I witnessed that. I witnessed the Holy Spirit coming upon him in the form of a dove. And it said, and he remained. It lets us know then that the Holy Spirit had never remained on anyone until that period. The Holy Spirit moved. The Holy Spirit filled. The Holy Spirit did those things as we read in the Old Testament. Great things the Holy Spirit did, and none of those things could have been done without the Holy Spirit. But here it talks about the beginning of the work of God, for the Holy Spirit remain upon Jesus and the, the word of God tells us that same Holy Spirit now what dwells in each believer on the Son of God that he dwells in us now I'm going to go one step further that if you're born again and God has entered into your life through the Spirit of God he remains he remains he remains he doesn't wash his hands of you because you dropped the ball he understands what he's getting when he came into our lives. He understood you're imperfect. The only thing perfect about you now is my life in you. And I'm going to work you. I'm going to work you. I'm going to grow you into me. And that's God's plan for us, that we would grow in the, into the understanding of who we are because of Christ Jesus our Lord. That we begin to understand this is not about being saved so people don't go to hell. This is about being saved that you might begin to embrace God's love and God's life that we have in us because of Jesus Christ our Lord. So verse 10 said, he who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe 
God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. And this is a testimony that God has given us what? Eternal life. Now, God gives you eternal life. You have eternal life in him. It's eternal. It means it's forever. That if he gave it to you, it's eternal. He didn't say this is on this it's all hinged on one thing. If you do everything I say and you do everything that I have you to do, if you dot every I, cross every T, it's going to remain in you. He says, no, if I give it to you, you have eternal life. Because why? There is no life apart from me. Because why? We were born in sin and sin brings forth death. So when you have Christ in your life, you have eternal life. And he says, it's my life to give and I gave it to you. And when I give it to you, it's eternal. So I don't know how long eternal is, but it means it's forever. I, I can't put a start and a stop on it. It's forever. And so when we know that, it begins to change us and we begin to understand it because why? I'm born again. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. And we're going to talk about that later. But it talks about that if we have his son's life in us, that we are born again. And the life that we have. It's an eternal life, and this life is in his son. Verse 12 goes on to say, who, He who has the son has life, and he who does not have the son of God does not have life. So there's only one way that a person can have life in this world in which we live is, is through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so when anybody tells you that, regardless of what their religious beliefs are, if they tell you that they have the same thing that you have and, and they can read their Bible or read their instructions or, or quote their beliefs, the word of God is clear. If you don't have my son, you don't have eternal life. I don't care what you, what you think you have. Have you ever thought you had something and you didn't? Then this is what it looks like. It looks like there's a ball that's been hit up in the air. The outfielder stands. The ball is coming right down to him. He's got his glove up. This is an easy out. Hits the glove and bounces out. Now we have seen that. There's no way that they would drop. They make these catches all the time and yet we've seen them drop the ball. No, what God has for us is that it's eternal life. And man can talk about many things, but there's only one way to the Father, and it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. How important is that? Because if you don't get this here, you can be swayed by any conversation that comes your way. So you have to know what you have. You have to know what you have in Christ Jesus, what God has given you, and what he has promised in his word, because why his promises are, are complete. They do not come up empty. They are that word that he given out that he says it will produce everything that he has said. These things I have written to you who believe in the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. So now we can know that we have eternal life. It's not just the fact that I know that I believe what was said to me. I believe the scripture, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We can quote it, but now he says you can know it. See, sometimes we've gotten, we have never gotten any farther than being able to quote it. We, we have it. But all we stand on is a quote. We have no idea exactly what that means, what we have in Christ Jesus. And it says that we as children of God who are born again, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And so then it says, then if I can know it, then it means there has to be something being revealed to us, revealed to us, that we know that this is real, that we have in Christ Jesus. This is what it looks like. Your life is moving in the right direction. I was in a group last night, and, and in the group, and we talked about how that we, we can be sober, we can be uh, off of drugs, we can, we can be coming out of those strongholds, but we're still dealing with the fact because of our addictions, we've lost a job. Because of that addiction, we've lost a house. Because of that addiction, we're, we're no longer with your family. So now you can be clean and still have no hope. Every bridge has been burnt. There are everybody who has reached out to you, you have messed over. There's no way that you can see how you can get anywhere to where you want to go. And then the thought comes to you, I've had opportunity after opportunity, and I figured out a way to mess that up. And so even if it does come to me, it probably won't last. 
because I've only been sober for two days or, or two weeks or two months or, or even a year, and, and none of these things have changed. But when you have Christ in your life, and he says to you, put your trust in me, then we hold on to the fact that my sobriety or this change in my life is because of him. Because why? I could not do this thing on my own. I've seen the people, been to the treatment. In fact, they can sit down and tell you what needs to be said in the group. The problem was, was that they couldn't live it out. And then Jesus comes in. I met a gentleman just recently, uh, uh, this past week, and I looked at him, and it just looked so, so good. And I knew something had changed in his life. He told me, he says, this is what has happened. I've gone to now Teen Challenge, and I've been there for quite some time. And I only got a few more weeks to go, and then I'm going on into the next program, the next step. That's nine months in Chicago. It's a year program and stuff. And he says, but you know, I've never been this good. He had been in and out of treatment centers and those things there. So I said, then what is the key? He says, you know what the key is, Pastor Money. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. He says that that was the change in his life. So when I'm sharing with the group that same story last night, I was letting them know that even though your life may be a mess with God, all things are possible. But when you have faith in God, this is what you're saying. I'll do the things I need to do. And right now, I'm that person who's wanting their life to be changed. What you need to do maybe for that son, that daughter, for that, for that mate, those parents, those grandparents who have invested in you, is just to get up every day and stay sober. Stay up every day and be functional. Stay up every day. And then when you're struggling with life, say to them, I need prayer because I'm struggling today. And I said to them, guess how many days you get out of the year with God? I said, what? I said, one day at a time. 365 days in a year, none of them are promised to you just today. And so every day we just check it off. I made it through the day, praise you God. Thank you, Lord, for that. I check it off the next day. I check it off the next day. Next thing you know, you got a week. But how did you get that week one day at a time? If you never lose focus on how you walk with God. Now, I'm talking to those who now know how to walk with God. Guess how many days you get to walk with Him? One day at a time. Nothing changes. Every one of us get one day at a time. And so what we begin to develop is that we begin to see how God is able to move. And that's what I was sharing with them. And so this is what happens. You don't have anything going your way, and then you find yourself having a place to stay. And then you find yourself doing the things that you know to do right. Well, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm just going to go to my meetings. I'm just going to do the things I know I'm supposed to do. I'm just going to go to the meetings, and I'm going to get back in my church. I'm going to do those things there. And the next thing you know, you meet somebody from the church, and you're going to the meetings, you're going to the meetings. And the next thing you know, because you're working with the person that you're going to the meetings with and stuff, you find yourself now going to work. Now you say, how did these things happen? God makes a way for his children. And when you begin to look at it, all you can say is that it had to be God. There's no way in the world I could have said, this is what's going to happen to me now that I got my life heading in the right direction. We have no idea what that's even about, except that God be us. And so what it says to us is these things are written that we who believe in the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. When these things happen to you, you begin to know it is Christ living in me. And if it's Christ living in me, then what do I have? I have eternal life through Christ Jesus. And so it's not a more, it's more than just the fact that God can provide for me. It tells me that I have eternity with Christ Jesus. So now I begin to focus my life on not just on how I live through each and every day. I focus my life on living each and every day for His glory. See, again, that's, that's a part of growth. Because a lot of us, we just need to get to a place where I can just get up every day and make this life work. But you begin to grow in him when you begin to understand what you have. I not only want my life to work, I want my life to glorify him. So then everything that we desire to do, we want to do it that he may get the glory. So then it says that you might know that you have eternal life, and it says and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So that tells me something else is going on. The more that I begin to walk in the, my life with him and watch the peace of God, the comfort of God, the joy of God, the hope of God, or the love of God begin to flow into my heart and into my life, how I look at things, and I'm looking at life through his lens, I begin to know then that what? that I can continue to believe in Christ Jesus. Because why? In those midst of those everyday struggles of life, 
And I don't care who you are, every day brings some struggles. Maybe not for this week or next week, just hold on, your turn is coming. Your turn is coming, nobody escapes it. Everybody has something going on in their life with one time or another. But you don't get rattled by it because why? You remind yourself who you belong to, what you have going on in you. Your hope is in Christ Jesus, and I have what? I have eternal life. And I have him who will lead and guide and direct my life because why? I've seen what he's already done. In the years past, we told you that those things that we've seen, what God has already done, they're called mile markers. It lets you know where you're at in the journey. And when you feel like you don't know where you need to go, you just look at the mile markers and say, God has been faithful here, he's been faithful here, he's been faithful here, he's been faithful here, he's been faithful here. Why should I doubt that he will be faithful to me now? Because why? I didn't know what was going to happen here and here and here and here and here. And yet God made a way for me. <laughs> and that's what it's talking about. That's talking about what God does for us when we know him and the power of his resurrection. That we might know that, he, that we can grow and continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And I like the fact that this word tells us that we may continue to believe. It says, why would he put in there that people have to be reminded that they can continue to believe in God. Because what happens to mankind, we get lazy. Life is good, we don't think about anything, this and that and the other. And all of a sudden, when things are tough, we're praying all the time, reading all the time, doing all those things, showing up at church, and now things have gotten a little better. You know, and, and God knows I've been working so hard and stuff, and, and, and I, I got a hard week coming up next week, so it's okay that if I stay home at night, because why? I can catch Pastor Money on, on the internet. I can look him up and, and I can get the message there. And it's, just, and it's just like being there, you know, and stuff. We lie to ourselves. And it says, with children of God, we have to know that we have to continue to walk and to believe in the name of the Son of God that God has called us and has called us that what? That we will walk with him in faith in every circumstance and situation and time in our life. That there's no time that we can ever think that we can walk and live a life apart from Him. And so that what, when, I, when I begin to understand that, then my faith will continue to grow. And then I will continue to believe that with Christ, what? All things are possible. That's what it says. That way I can believe, that I can continue to believe with God all things are possible. Now, it's not just now for my own life. I'm able to believe that all things are possible because why? God puts us in this world that we can be light in the midst of this world, that we can be soft, that we can impact, make a difference, and I can begin to share with other people about a God that can do anything. And we say, what is anything? Well, if you can save a person like you, you ought to be able to serve a person like them. See, I know what you're thinking. You thought it's going to save a person like me. But tonight I just switched it on you, didn't it? If he can save a person like you, then he ought to be able to save anybody. He ought to be able to save anybody. So when we're looking at this word, it tells us that we can continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. And that's what it said. That I can believe in God's Son in every circumstance, situation. So the parent who's raising the children, we say sometimes when they're struggling, Train the child in the way they should go, that when they grow up, they will not depart. That's one thing with the 13, 14, 15, early 20s, 30s, and now they're 40, and now oh, they're 50 now, and uh, I, I'm not seeing any change. My question is, is that how hard are you praying? See, because believing that what the scripture says, then I begin to pray in that instance. I begin to talk in that instance. It doesn't matter if that child is believing in that. I don't want to hear it. Well, when you walk into my house, you got to hear it. And I need to let them know, I'm praying for you. Your life is going to get better because why I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And I'm believing God for you. I'm trusting God for you. Because why we're believing that what he hears are prayers of his people. And so if the people begin to pray, should we not then expect God to move and something to happen? That's what happens when we continue to grow in our faith in this Christian walk with Christ Jesus. So when it talked about there earlier that it says that I may continue to believe in the Son of God, that not only do I believe that he's able to save life, he's able to transform life. He's able to lead the 99 bring back the one. He's able to touch those lives because why? We're now so bright. We are so bright. We're truly being beacon lights out there. And when you have that bright light, I heard 
uh, Bethany was talking to me today. She said, we have just a little bitty light outside our, our house, and then we change that, and we put these other lights in, and now when you turn them on, they almost blind you. But that's what our lives ought to be like. Our lives ought to be in such a way that it ought, ought, it ought to be almost blinding. Because the glory of God is being revealed, being shown how we live and how we trust Him, how we believe, that it begins to, to say to them, I, I don't have a chance. They're praying for me. They're praying for me. They're praying for me. To the point that they may get mad and say, stop praying for me. You know, that's what God should be doing in our hearts and in our lives. We should begin to believe that we can change our community, our, our, our family's lives. We can change the condition of the world through the power of prayer. And that's what happens when we be, begin to believe that we are putting our trust, what? Completely in the Son of God. Now, this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we have this petition that we have asked of him. That we know that our relationship is, is such that I know then that if I'm praying to my father, my father hears me. When I'm praying to my father in the name of his son, my father hears me. Now this is what I also know. There have been many of mothers that have been dead tired and couldn't hear anything except that baby when it cries. And wake out of that sleep and immediately go right there. That's our Father. It doesn't matter what you're going through in life. He hears the cries of His people. And so He says to us that He hears our prayers. And if we ask anything of Him, we know that he, we have a petition that we have asked of Him. He hears. He gathers. And if we're saying, Lord, and this is an unselfish prayer, Lord, I'm just asking you that you save my family. Help me, Lord. Lord, show me what I need to do. And maybe sometimes he's just saying to you, back off. You planted your water, now let me bring the increase. You just keep on and you live like trusting me. Live like trusting me. That's what God is calling us all to do. Is live life trusting him. And then so that is our first inward proof. There's an inward proof in every one of us that we are alive in Christ Jesus. And then it says the second one is an outgoing proof. In 1 John 4, verse 7, it says, Everyone who lives, everyone who loves is born of God, knowing God through love. And so as we're looking at the text of 1 John chapter 4, it says this is outgoing proof of new birth. 1 John 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Hmm. Sometimes I, I, I question myself and, and other believers because I don't see much love. And it says, and if we love one another, for love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. So it tells me then that I have to begin to love in a God-like manner. And so it tells us why we need to do that. In this God-like manner, for he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this, the love of God, was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. And in this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the, the offering uh, for our sins that the Father would receive. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We are to love our fellow man with the love of God. And this we are not capable of doing in the flesh. We must let God love man through us can't do this in our flesh. Because when he said, I sent you to love as I have loved you, he said, you can't. There are things that are going on in people's life and you're just saying, I can't love that person. I, I can't love that person. That person was drunk and ran over my loved one. And God, you're telling me to love. And yet we read the stories and hear the stories. There was a woman and uh, a young girl, and she was texting, talking, 
and he had a woman who was on her body, and um, an older lady, and, and she died. And um, she met her husband. And out of that relationship of the husband, he said to the girl, she said, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know which, I don't know what to do. I, I'm sorry for your loss. He told her, don't be sorry for my loss. If you really want to do something, this is what my wife would do. She would walk in the things of the Lord. She would, she would share and she would, she would tell you right now that you are forgiven. And so if you really want to do something for me, then I want you to take her place. That girl began to spend time with that man. And she began to know the love of God. And that man embraced her like she was one of his. And he said, I'm doing this because this is the way she would have done it. This is who my wife was. She was a believer in Christ Jesus. And so if you really want to, to do something with your life, you need to know the Jesus that my wife knew. And she was on Dr. Dobson's show. And she was saying, I go into schools now and I share with teenagers. Tell them about what God has done in my life. I saw such great love from this man. And he said, if you want to do something, then I want you to take up where my wife left off. I want you to be a light in this community. I want you to touch lives with others and, and encourage others in the faith. So when we're talking about that, that this love that we have, the love that God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. We are to love our fellow man with the love of God. This we are not capable of doing in the flesh. We must let God love man through us. Because why? When that begins to happen, we can look past the faults of others because we recognize that God looked past our faults and saw our need. That we understand that he knew what he was getting when he got us. And he knew we needed a Savior. And he's going to say to us, who out there doesn't need me? Who out there does? Lord, they've been so bad and that means they probably need me more than the next guy, huh? See, there's nobody out there that, that is out there in the world who doesn't need Jesus. But only till the church begins to understand that we're here to let everyone know they need Jesus and that God loves them, that we begin to rub up against them. We begin to have coffee and they'll begin to say to you, why do you want to hang out with me? Why do you want to be bothered with somebody like me? Well, because God told me to. What did God tell you? He said he wanted me to love you like he loves me. Well, I don't need your love. Well, it sounds like you need something. It sounds like you want something. I mean, we've only been talking now for three or four times we've met. In case you knew what I was about, and you keep meeting with me, it tells me that you're looking for something. What I'm saying is that sometimes it's going to take work on our, on our behalf, but if we're going to begin to love like God loves, when we begin to examine our own lives, how many times has the Holy Spirit ministered to us over our years, over our time with him, that he's reminded us that he is there, that he's reminded us we're not in the place that he would have us to be, and yet he keeps reminding us how much he loves us. And then he reminds us that I have a place and a plan for your life, a plan that you might succeed, a plan that you might grow in me and to know me and the power of my resurrection, that you can know the way that I love because of the way that you begin, that I love you, that you'll know how to love one another. Now that love, we talked about just a second ago, talked about that person that was just far out. But sometimes we can have a person that's so close to us. And we were laughing and talking about what my grandmother said. My grandmother never said anything about not loving us. But she did say sometimes, I just don't like you. But she always loved us. And because she loved us, we were still baby, and baby, this is what you need to do. This is where you need to be. And I remember having that relationship with my mother's mom. And Grandma and I would spend time at, at, on the phone and praying for the family and praying about circumstances and situations. I would go over to her house there in Peoria in the apartment where she lived, and, and I would spend time with her, and we'd talk about God's Word. We would have such a great time. And of all of the, the great-grandchildren, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, I had this relationship with Grandma that none of the other grandkids had. Our relationship was Jesus. 
And because of that, she began to share different things about who I needed to pray for, why I needed to pray for her son, and those things there. And I remember saying to Uncle Earl that before he passed, he was dying of cancer. I said, Uncle Earl and Grandma has said that you had been hurt by the church, but she needed to let you know and wanted me to remind you that Jesus loves you. And I remember him saying, I know he does. I know he does. He had just went to church uh, several weeks before things really got bad. But he says, I know that God loves me. I know he does. And we began to have prayer and have that time. And over those next week or so before he passed, there was the assurance of knowing that Grandma's prayers had been answered. That her son was, was right where he needed to be. That it didn't matter that he said, I'm ready that I'm ready. And that's what God is saying about our prayers, that when we have that relationship with Him, that we ought to have a love relationship that does what? That love relationship begins to have an outgoing proof that Christ is alive in us. The outgoing proof that we love one another as Christ loves us. As we should be moving out. We have it in, now we're putting it out that other people might know this truth that will set them free. And then it says in this outgoing proof that we have in Christ, also spoke, is spoken in Romans chapter 5. It talks about the faith and the triumph and trouble and then Christ's love in our place. And when we look at Romans 5, verse 1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom, we, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we have stand. And rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And Paul writes in this letter to the Romans, to those that are the Gentiles, and he's encouraging. And he said, and therefore having been justified by faith, that we have been freed from sin, and that we're no longer guilty because of the finished work of Christ, and that we have a right to, to live a life because we have been forgiven. We have peace with God, because before Christ comes into our life, what we were we were what? Enemies of God. But now we're sons of God. We're children of God. So we have peace with God. And it comes what? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through Jesus Christ to whom also we have access by faith into this grace. This grace, something that was given to us that we did not earn. This grace in which we stand. This grace that allows us to be able to stand in this life is because of the new birth that we have in Christ Jesus. And because of that, we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And we can rejoice in the fact that what is our hope in Christ? Our hope is that one day he's coming back. Our hope is that in him, that, that we will be with him, that we have a hope that makes us not ashamed. We live a life trusting in him. They say, well, how come you have hope in this world when you see it being like it is? I see Jesus. I see Jesus. And that when I'm looking at the world and the struggle that the world is, I see the need of Jesus even more. And I know why he came. Because without him, this is the best that man can ever be. Lost without hope. But we have hope because we have Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so in here in Romans, it tells us that we can rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations. It tells us that when we're going through hard times, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance, and that we trust in God and we're believing God, I'm going through a tough time. I already said to you earlier, if you're not going through a tough time, hold on, your turn's coming. Your, it's, it's coming. It's inevitable that if you're living in this world, there's going to be something that's going to come that's going to affect your life. It may not be the same as the loss of a child or of a, of a loved one, a, a mate or any of those things there. But it could be a loss of a job, a being loss of a, a, a great friendship. It could be loss of, of those things that have been dear to you. It could be loss of, of income. It could be loss of, we have the longest night. The longest night is just not all about meeting those who have lost a loved one, but it's going, meeting those who have gone through loss. That they just feel right now they have no other place to go. They, they don't know what tomorrow's going to bring to them. They, they feel helpless. And, and that night when we gather, it's talking about what we can find in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So it says that we also glory, that we give God the glory and praise because, why? Lord, when I'm going through this, I'm not going through this alone. When you go through the fire, I'll be there. When you go through the flood, I will be there. Then it tells us that we're not drowned and we'll not be burned. That he will be with us no matter what we're going through in this life. 
that we find ourselves in. And because of that, we're able to rejoice in, in the glory of, of him in the midst of the struggles that we find ourselves dealing with, knowing that what the tribulations uh, produces perseverance. What it tells us is as we go through these things, we get stronger. We get stronger. How do we get stronger? We get stronger in our belief and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God that is in us. That is able that we're able to keep our cool, that we're able to continue to breathe. We're not we're not going out of our mind because God is in the midst of the struggles of life that we deal with. The everyday things that we find ourselves facing. And because of that, it says that we will begin to produce perseverance. And this is a perseverance produces character. Have you ever seen children of God who lack the character of God? When things come, all of a sudden, the worldliness begins to come back. We see it many times in young Christians, baby Christians. They're feeling good as long as everything's on the high, but as soon as the trouble comes, their mouth has all kinds of vomit coming out of it. Uh, the words that they're saying, the things that they're doing, they begin to think about how they can live uh, and the life that they lived in before that God has separated them from because why? Uh, that's maybe the only way they think they can make money or the only way that they can find peace. No, I just need to get high. I just need to do this. I just need to do that. In fact, I, I know that sometimes I've never been one, but I remember smokers saying, I went through this and I just had to have a cigarette. I just had to have it. I just had to have it. What I'm just saying is that it tells us that when we begin to trust God, that we don't have to go back to the things of the old nature to find a peace and a comfort in, that we have it in Christ Jesus, that we begin to grow in him. And it says then you begin to grow and you have character. Now, how important is this character is because why? We're living in the world. And when you're going through something, guess what? You're not the only one. You're not the only one. I know that you feel like nobody knows the trouble I see. Nobody knows but Jesus. Well, I can tell you right now, there's 100,000 people that know the trouble that you're going through. They know about your hurt and pain because why they're going through the same hurt and pain. But the Word of God tells us that when we allow God to begin to have His way, it tells us that we begin to go through these things with perseverance and we have a character that begins to emulate that of Christ Jesus our Lord. How did he look when he was there? He was being beaten. He, in fact, he'd been going from trial to trial to trial to trial through that night. None of them legal. None of them right. They've been challenging him. They, they spit on him. They, they talked about him. All of those things. And he said not a word before his accusers. Then they go on and they, they take him down and they say, well, you know, let's beat him a little bit and, and then let's send him on his way. But they beat him unmercifully. And still he did not do anything. And you remember, I said, don't you know that I have power to, to save you as, as well as to destroy you? He says, you don't have any power other than what my father gives you. Now that is character. That is character. But then you say, but he's the son of man. He's the son of God. He ought to have that character. Then we find their statement in Acts. We find that he's been persecuted. In fact, Saul's there. And it says that he was preaching the gospel and he was preaching and sharing to them. They got angry with him. And they said that they drug him out of the city because why? You can't stone anybody inside the walls. They, they drug him out. They were really religious. They were still going to stone him. So we drag him out. And so, so this would be right. We can stone him out here. We can't stone him in there. They stoned him. They said they were so angry at him that they bit him. And they, they were just biting him. They, they were just so full of anger. And it says that his face began to shine like that of an angel. And he saw Jesus on the right hand of the Father. And he says, Father, do not hold this to their charge. Sound like forgive them, for they know not what they do. The glory of God was upon him. What it says is that in death he had God's character. Perseverance. Trusting God. The hope that makes you not ashamed. That you continue to believe what God has called you to do. Then it says that the character brings then hope. Hope is built out of troubles. Your hope is built as being stronger when you begin to know my hope's in Jesus, not in the stuff, not into the things. My hope is not in this. My hope is in Him. Him who is able to do exceedingly above all that we have asked or 
hope for. That's who our hope is in. Now, hope does not disappoint. It tells us when we put our trust in Jesus, it will not disappoint us that we trusted God to the very end. I have prayed with those. Remember years ago, a good friend of mine, Tom, had cancer and been fighting it down for, for a year and a half or so, and, and it seems like he was about to lose this battle. And, uh, and yet I, as we talked, and I began to remember and I began to see him even now, we talked about the things of the Lord. And he was letting me know it's all right. It's all right. Now, he, he didn't want to leave Becky, his wife. He didn't want to leave his daughters. But he said, it's all right. I know where I'm going. And he says, and that hope makes us not ashamed, no matter what we're going through, that we have a trust in God, no matter what. Yes, a party is that they don't want to leave. And yet in the midst of it, what they begin to do is they know that their time is drawing near. They want, they're holding on because why? They want to make sure they're all right. Isn't that something? They're more concerned about us than their own well-being. Because why? God gives us a hope. A hope that makes us not ashamed. And that's what I've seen when people are, are, are at the end of their, or they're at the end of their life or at the beginning of new life. Life is what we know it, but life like we pray that is promised through the word of God, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Because of the, the love of God, it says that, first of all, it says character, and then verse 5, it says, Now hope does not disappoint us, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, who, has, who was given to us. My grandmother that I was speaking of, my mom's mother, Grandma Geneva, Mama Geneva, we called her. She's laying there in her bed, and, and she's about to enter into the presence of God. And she kept mumbling something. And I heard the family saying, what is she saying? She says, the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart. And all she kept saying, I have the love of God in my heart. It covers me, the love of God in her heart. There was no fear, there was nothing, there was just a peace that was upon her. Family was crying, all of those things, her grandma was in peace. And all she kept saying, that the love of God has been shed abroad in her heart. Because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For then we are still without strength in due time. Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his love towards us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God died for them, for the ungodly. And he is saying, I want you to love as I have loved you. Because why? We're the ungodly. And he died for us that we might have life that is in him. And then the third outward proof. Tonight as we look at it, out of 1 John 2. Verse 29, everyone, every also who practice righteousness is born of him. So now we've talked about that there's a, a, an inward. Then we also talked about there's a proof that is outward. And then it says there's a, or, or a proof that's outgoing that goes beyond that is demonstrated. And then there's an outward proof. Everyone also practice righteousness Everyone who also who practices righteousness what is born of him, born of Jesus. This is outward proof of new birth. 1 John 2, 29. Let truth abide in you. We are what? We are the children of God. Verse 24 says, Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Now, what did they hear in the beginning? We know that John 3.16, John 3.16, God so loved the world, they heard that. But then we also know the scripture said that Jesus died, 
according to the scriptures. He was buried according to the scriptures. He rose on the third day according to the scriptures. He rose and, and he says that now on the right hand of the Father according to the scripture. And he says then because we have heard, we have heard from the beginning of what you heard from the beginning abides in you. And that who puts their faith in him have what? Eternal life. Have new life. If you have heard what you and believe what you've heard from the beginning and it lives in you, abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Because what? You can't have the Father without having the Son. And if the Son is in you, guess what? You have the Father. You have the Father in you, and that's what it's telling us. That we are connected, and Jesus put it this way, that as I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, that we are one. He says, I'm in you, and you are in me. And there's a oneness that we have through Jesus Christ with the Father. A oneness. These things are so important because why? Sometimes in this world, Children of God in the third world country doesn't have what the, the least of us in this country have. And they're praising God with all of their heart. And the might of God is moving in the midst of the people. We're going to have an opportunity to go to Hungary at the end of May. And when we're talking to Stuart Humphrey, who spent 13 years in Hungary, he says right now, for the people... Romans, I think they said that called, but uh, we know them as uh, gypsies. He said, but you don't call them that because that's, that's a derogatory statement. He said, but they are being saved by the tens of thousands. People that no one thinks amount to nothing. They are grabbing hold of the gospel of Jesus Christ and their lives are being changed. That's who he came for. He came for those that would abide in him, that would trust him, that would believe on the Son of God, and that the promise of God was for them. They are coming to eternal life in Christ Jesus. In verse 25, and this is the promise that he has promised us eternal life. So important, and I, I've been hitting on this for the last six months, uh, that how important eternal life is to us through this study. How important it is to know what it is that we have eternal life in Christ Jesus. Because we have to see bigger than what we're looking at in this world in which you live in. We have to see something greater than what we're looking at in this world. Because it's looking through the lens of Jesus and the greatness of God that you can begin to see greatness happening upon the lives of those who live in this world. And I think this is where we've lost focus as Christians because we haven't spent the time looking at the eternal promises of God, seeing the greater thing, and understanding how great it is that we have eternal life. And because of eternal life, it allows us to live life here in Christ Jesus, beginning to experience what God has in store for us. And that because of that, we now can see through the lens of Jesus and find hope and see hope for those who are living in a world of hopelessness. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. He wants us to see in such a way that there's an outward proof that, that we believe what God has offered us. And this is a promise that he has promised us what eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. What it's telling us here is that first of all, as we begin to live in this life in Christ Jesus, the truth of our salvation becomes clearer and more real each and every moment as we walk in faith in God. And so when we're looking at this text, it just tells us that we're abiding in him, that the anointing of God, his life in us, that he has anointed us to a new life through Jesus Christ, which you have received from him that abides in him, in you, the Holy Spirit is in us, and the Holy Spirit is teaching us and, and telling us uh, these things of Jesus Christ, and what, the, what he has done in the eternity for us, that this life we have in us, and you do, not need that anyone teach you and it says that men can really not teach you they can point you to it but the holy spirit is the one who reveals to us 
this life that we have in him. And what people can do is begin to point us in the direction, but we have to begin to experience that we can see for ourselves what God has done in us. When you begin to see life changes in you, the way you think, the way you do, the way you act, the way you live, those begin to say to you that there's Christ living in you. I'm not talking about that you're dotting I's and crossing T's and that you're doing better so you don't cuss, so you don't do this. If you have not love, it says you have not anything. You don't have anything. You're just a, a clanging symbol. You're just a lot of noise. If you're talking all the right stuff but you don't have a love, so it's not about that I look good. It doesn't mean that I have everything polished. What it does mean is that when life circumstances, situation, I respond out of the life of Christ that I have in me. And it says, and when we begin to do that, it begins to teach us that I can do all things through Christ, who is my strength. These all things, it's not just about keeping you from sin. It's about living for God in every circumstance, situation. To trust Him to give you the right words at the right time. To be an encouragement to others just by the way you do the things that you do. But the anointing which you have received from Him, verse 27, abides in you. The Holy Spirit does. And you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning what? All things and is true. And it's not a lie. Christ in us, what? The hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And it's not a lie. This thing is real. So when people say, you know, I, I've been a Christian, but you know, I really don't see nothing. Now, the Word of God tells us that we need to examine ourselves to make sure that we are saved. That says you need to check your salvation. You need to check to see, do you really believe and put your trust in Him? Because if you're saying, I've been a Christian for 30 years and I ain't never seen God do anything, then I need to tell you, you've been a member of the church for 30 years. You don't know him who has saved you. You don't know him. Because you cannot be a believer in Christ and not know the goodness of God. You have to say you have not seen him move in anywhere in your circumstance situations. Then you don't know him. You don't know him. Evidently, you still think you're the one that's in charge. Instead of knowing that it is God that's leading you and directing you in your life, the anointing of God will teach us concerning all things, and it is true, and it is not a lie. And just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Then I begin to understand the word of God. I'm standing on it. We're standing on it. We haven't walked across it yet, but we're standing on it. And now we're beginning to say, Lord, I'm going to walk in it. I don't know what the results are, but God says to do this do this, then we're going to do it. And so this is what it looks like possibly to us, or maybe to me, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm because I'm slow. Um, was it Naaman, the leper? Yes, the one. It says, you can go ask the prophet and they'll tell you. He says, well, go dip yourself in the Jordan seven times. He said, we got all this other clean water here. Why does he want me to dip in this dirty water of the Jordan? And then the servant girl said to him, do you want the leprosy or do you want to be clean? So he begins to dip. He dips one time, nothing changes. He dips second time, nothing changes. He dips, dips the third time, the fourth, the fifth, nothing's changed. And I know that he's like you and like me. Every time he got up, he was looking. But then he dipped the sixth time. And then it says when he dipped the seventh time, his skin was that of like a newborn baby. See, it would have said to us as, as children of God, that we have to hang in there. We have to stand on God's word. It may not move as fast as we like it, but God's word is God's word, and it will never not do what it says. If he has promised in his word, then he's going to complete his promise to us. And that is just and has taught you, and you will abide in him. And we will stay in him because what? We're abiding in him, and what the word tells us what? That he's the true vine. We're just the branches. That there is no life for us if we're not connected to Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so I have to stay connected. I need to continue to be in that place where I can get the nourishment for life that only he can give us. 
So it tells me then that as children of God, in verse 28, now little children, abiding in him, and when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. What it tells us that each and every time we put our trust in him, it reassures us that he is coming back again. And when you continue to allow your faith to, to know that he's coming back again, you have a confidence in him and you will not be put to shame. The world may tell you that you're crazy for trusting God. How are you going to trust somebody you can't see? But the truth of it is, every time we see God moving in people's lives, we can see him. Because why? It ain't us that's doing it, it's Christ doing it in us. It is his life that is in us. So he's been revealed. He's been revealed day in and day out when we recognize it is no longer I that lives, but it is Christ what that lives within me. So he can be seen. He can be seen in the works of, of people. And we, we were talking the other night at the dinner that no matter how bad life gets and how bad and destruction is and people talk about Christians and, and they're not this and they're not that, you let a disaster happen in any part of the world and the first people on the scene will be Christians. And they're not charging you in anything. They're going, they're, they're leaving their jobs, they're leaving their family. Why? Because you're in need. And God said, let's go, that they might see me. They said that when they went to Houston, Stuart Humphrey, uh, uh, the, uh, the missionary that I've been talking about, Stuart said we went down there, and this has been about three or four months ago, they were down there. And that still the people were overwhelmed that you guys will come here and do this for us. And they were tearing out the, carrying out all the bad stuff and they were repairing and all of those things. They were giving out the food and then they were sharing Christ in the midst of it. And they had more opportunities to pray with people because people said, we can't believe that you're coming in from all over the country to care about us. And when people were, were talking about how broken they were, they were being encouraged about the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He said it was the greatest opportunity. And he says, and the work there is still ongoing, ongoing. We think it's happened, it's happened so long ago, but even parts of Louisiana, uh, New Orleans, is, is still not where it needs to be. The destruction, the, the, the thing that comes through there, there's work to do in this world, and, and people need to know that the children of God believe what the Father has said in them. So as children of God, we're going to abide in Him. And when He appears, we have confidence, and we're not ashamed before Him at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. And so we want to live a life that brings Him glory and brings Him honor, and then um, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, verse 16 says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer, because we have been transformed. If we come to know him, we were sinners lost, but now we know him by the Spirit of God that has transformed us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. It tells us then that the, the map of life is totally different now that Christ is in there. How we live, how we go, the things we do, the things we say, how we live. And it tells us because of Christ, what we could not do in our natural, we can begin to do in the supernatural through the life that Christ has in us. Everyone also who practice righteousness is born of him. And if you're born of God, you will make a practice of doing right at all times, at all costs. So no longer I. We're willing to go the extra mile, turn the other cheek, Share what we have. I'll, I'll share out of my lack that you might have something too. And then verse 18 goes on to tell us, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled to us, to himself, through Jesus Christ. Reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself 
not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That is shown of God that we're telling them that we owe a debt that we cannot pay, but Jesus Christ has paid the debt for us, and that he has paid the debt for you, and that what you are trying to do in yourself, you can't, but you need to know that Jesus has done it, and all you have to do is receive it. And we need to be sharing this hope with others. And in verse 20 says, Now and then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. And verse, ambassadors telling them about the world, uh, the, the, the nation that we represent, the kingdom of God. That we're ambassadors of his kingdom. And we're telling everyone about the goodness of his love and and how much he loves and, and how he's able to transform, how he's able to change our lives and, and, and give us new life in him and that it is real. And that we're an ambassador and everywhere we're going, we're representing because we're no longer of this world. We're of the kingdom of God and as though God were pleading through us and we implore you as Christ on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That the righteousness of God can be seen today through Jesus Christ our Lord. And this is outward proof of new birth. If you do not have a threefold proof of new birth, now is the time to get on your knees and accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior by faith in his precarious death and burial and resurrection. And it talks about his precarious uh, sacrifice. It talks about one who performed or suffered by one person as a substitute for another or to benefit, to the benefit or the advantage of another. That tells us that Jesus took our place, that he substituted himself for our sins he died the death that we should die. He suffered in our behalf. He did this freely. It was a vicarious sacrifice that he gave for us. And this is a hope that we share with everyone. When we talk about new birth, it's more than John 3, 16. It's talking about the way we live, the things we do, the things we hope in, the things that we expect to have and be able to do because of Christ who is our Savior. That we begin to understand that when we talk about I can do all things through Christ who is my strength, what it talks about is my dependency upon Him allows me to do things that I thought were impossible to do. Some may say, yes, ma'am. Pastor, this past Sunday during Children's Church, I taught him about that God is amazing. One of the little boys, his name is Bradley, I can't tell you the last name, he's being bullied in school. And I told him that I would pray for him, that we would all pray for him. So please, help me. And as I prayed in my mind to try to ask the Lord how I can help this child, he says, well, God can't keep me safe from a bully. After I had taught him the lesson about how amazing how God had healed the little boy from afar. Um, so please, please, it's been on my heart and my mind so much. And if we as a church could join together and pray for this boy to Amen. see God Amen. in this bully situation, Amen. that he could see Amen. God. Amen. Thank you. All. Father, we just come right now, Lord, we love to Bradley to you. Lord, and we thank you, Heavenly Father, Lord, for your love, your mercy, your grace. And not only, Lord, are you not only able to keep him, Lord, you'll bring support around him. There'll be other boys and girls that understand what he's going through. But they know about your love and they will come alongside of him. They will not pick at him, but they will encourage him. They'll let him know that they're there for him. And they will remind others that if you go to Bradley, you have to go through us. Lord, we're believing today, Lord, that our children are getting it, that they're understanding of your, your great love, and that you're able to do exceedingly above all that they have hoped or imagined. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that we will have the faith of a child to trust you, Lord. And so as we pray for Bradley, Lord, we pray for one another. 
that we will believe you, Lord, for the circumstances and situations in our own life, that you are an amazing God, able to do that that we cannot see being done except it be done through you. I'm reminded, Lord, in the scripture that you hung the, the sun into space. And Lord, from that day on, it has consistently rose in the east and set in the west. That is a, a document, that is a statement of saying that what you have promised in your word is eternal. And Lord, so we believe today, Lord, that the covering he needs has been given. And we're going to give you praise and give you glory. And so, Lord, not only in this moment we're praying, but we'll continue to pray that not only you will show him, but even those in this class, the Sunday school class, that are in his class, will begin to come around him to let him know we're going to walk with you. And they need to know they have to go through all of us to get to you. And so, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for who you are. May our children, and may we see as children, the glory of your hand in Jesus' name we pray.